when you studied counterpoint, where did you do your exercises? Uh, it was usually at the notebook. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On, on the desk. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And you were given assignments uh, that were to be written out problems to be solved with your pencil, right? Mm -hmm. Problems that you solve according to the rules of counterpoint. And were you required to play your homework? Um, yeah, we played it for class. Good. That's a step. When we were teaching counterpoint at New England Conservatory, we in, in, instituted the bold innovation of actually requiring the students to play their exercises as they were doing them. And it made a difference. I tell you, it made a difference. And so this is the difference between old counterpoint study and modern counterpoint study, essentially is that there's every reason to believe that when our famous composers studied counterpoint, they studied it by making it at the keyboard and playing it. And that they studied examples of counterpoint by playing them. You can find, for instance, if even, even in the new, in the so-called modern edition of the Swalik composition rules, you can find counterpoint examples written out, not in open score, but in keyboard score with the hand distribution arranged so that you, you can see exactly how the, how the hands would play these examples in dividing between the, the right and left hand. So we want to play some counterpoint examples. And so we just need somebody who, who can, can read pretty well. Atsuko, could you? perform the first verse for us. So we want to hear this, and we want to study what we are hearing as she plays. So I'm going to ask her to do it twice, to play it twice. And when she plays it the first time, I would like you not to look at the paper, okay? But instead to listen to the subjects, or to the order of the subject. Uh, notice how many entries of the subject there are, and in what voice, and so on and so on. Take your paper, please, and turn it over. How many voices? Three or four? How many voices? What do we say? How many voices? Four? 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 Six entrances. Six? Ah, thank you. Four voices, six entrances. Is that correct? Maybe. Okay. What was the first voice? Soprano, alto, tenor, or bass? Soprano? Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Second voice? Alto. Third voice? Mm -hmm. This is a very important thing to notice because this, this is one important recipe for success. <laughs> this is a very nice arrangement that you start at the top and you work your way down. It's useful for many things in life. You start at the top and <laughs> you work your way down. <laughs> and uh, now I ask a little bit more complicated question. Um, did this piece use a real answer or a tonal answer? Tonal answer. And how could you tell? What's the difference? Uh, because of the 
interval at the beginning mm -hmm. of the subject. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, please don't look yet. Just listen to the very beginning. Say it again. What is the tonal? How? What's the difference between a tonal answer and a real answer? Go ahead. Uh, well, the real is going to have the exact same intervals. Uh -huh. um, so. Um, okay. Take it to when, okay. For, so because not everybody has English as first language, I should explain some of the terminology. Because even if English is your first language, we are also dealing with theory speak, uh, which is its own language and, and uh, can be more complicated according to who your teacher was. And so uh, when we speak about the answer, that is the second entry of the subject. Okay, so the, we, we use this word answer to describe the second entry of the subject. So it's still the subject, it's not a counter subject, it's the subject, but it, it is answering the first entry of the subject. Okay. And so we call it a tonal answer because, well, one thing that is true is what he just said, it does not follow exactly the same intervals as the first statement of the subject, but why not? Well, you'd end up <clears throat> in a different key then, after your your answer, or it would be. A... The answer would then be. That's possible. In fact, there's uh, towards the end of our handouts, we'll find an, an example where he does basically that. But if he did that, it would not be really going to the dominant there, which is also possible that you don't do that. But his intention here was to give you a structure that gives you the mode of the piece. In other words, mode one, you want to to outline the principal notes of the mode, the, the tonic note, the dominant note. So you could say that, uh, that the scale is divided into two parts and they, not, they are not equal parts. Because to go from one to five is a greater distance than to go from five to eight. So the upper half is one step smaller than the lower half. Well, what he does is he gives you a subject that starts with five and goes to eight. And therefore, he wants to give you an answer that starts with one and goes to five. And so we have to extend that uh, interval in order to do that. There is a very interesting recent uh, book on counterpoint by one of my colleagues at McGill named Peter Schubert. And he has a uh, I think a very good short explanation of the tonal answer. And it's this. Tonic answers dominant. Dominant answers tonic. Okay? So subject is dominant tonic. So for the answer, the tonic answers the dominant, and the dominant answers the tonic. And you can plug in subjects of different shapes to this, and it still works. So uh, it's a good way just to, to remember this. OK. So this means that our subject, if he had started with this, that also would have been possible that that could have been the subject. And if that were the case, then the answer would be okay. 
So it's interchangeable how you want to do it. So he could have made a verset that was. <laughs> So now, would somebody else just play this once uh, so that we hear one more performance of this? And this time we'll look at the music as we play and take in all these things. So volunteer to do this. Devin. So let's ask ourselves, if we wanted to be able to make a piece like this, even though we don't live in 1615, we are not living in Italy, we are not looking at the mountains, we are not eating the wonderful food, we are not looking at 1615 Renaissance and very early Baroque architecture and art. But here we are just all by ourselves, but we still want to be able to make music like this. What would we have to know? What are the skills that we need to have in order to improvise, to compose while playing this set? Any ideas? Do we already know everything we need to know? Maybe. <laughs> it's possible that you know what you need to know, but just need the experience in doing it. Because experience gives you the knowledge that's missing now. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, excellent, excellent. OK, because as soon as you have more than one voice, you have harmony. As soon as you have simultaneously sounding intervals, you have harmony. We tend to think today that harmony is a separate category of, of music, and we study harmony, and, and then we look back at the earlier times and we say, ah, they studied counterpoint, and then later they studied thorough bass. And we, we read that those two were somehow opposed so either in the earlier time you are composing according to your knowledge of counterpoint, and later on uh, that was old-fashioned, and now you're composing according to the principles of thorough bass. And it's true, they had these discussions, but I think we often understand them not in quite the right way. We need to think of harmony as the result of having more than one note sounding at the same time, and that we make harmony every time we make counterpoint. So one thing we can do is to approach our making of counterpoint from the perspective of making harmony. I think this makes it easier uh, if we do this. So, so fundamental to doing all of this is that we have to know how to harmonize something. So this means when we have the exposition of the subject, we have only one voice, <laughs> 